for reading Torah to to the Rabbah. Uh, We are, well, at least to start, we are running very much on time, which is terrific. Um, It is certainly my pleasure to welcome you to our Tikkun community, Tikkun Lel Shavuot. Uh, the first time we've been able to do this in person in three years, and certainly that is worth uh, noting and celebrating. Um, Bernie Weinstein's going to be the MC for most of the evening, but he asked if I could just kind of lead things off and introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, I do want to note that just in case you haven't been to a Tikkun Lao Shavuot and or need a little refresher on what this is. Uh, The idea was that in the days leading up to the revelation at Mount Sinai, as told in the book of Exodus, there was a great deal of excitement, a great deal of anticipation. And there was so much anticipation, our sages teach us, that the Israelites, the night before the great moment of revelation, stayed up all night. And just as Shavuot is considered to be the anniversary of that revelation, we commemorate that every year, if possible, staying up all night and learning words of Torah. And now Torah uh, is not just the, uh, at least in this context, is not simply the five books of Moses, of course, although of course it is certainly our foundational text, but it is Uh, really any kind of Jewish text, anything that brings us closer to Jewish teaching and brings us closer to trying to understand what God expects from us here on earth. And so this is a very much a sacred uh, endeavor that we are, uh, that we're going to be enjoying. We have, uh, besides our keynote speakers, six other speakers throughout the night. We hope that you will stick around for as much as possible. If you feel a little tired, if you feel a little zonked, uh, it's okay. Nobody's going to take offense. I certainly won't take offense when I'm speaking. I mean, that's really, you you feel, do what you want then. Uh, But uh, just so we know that at 5 a.m., we will have a sunrise service Uh, And so we can experience Revelation again uh, as quickly, as early as we can on the first day of Shavuot. So I'm going to, and and, sorry, one more thing before I bring up our uh, our speaker. Um, The committee to put together this uh, Tikkun Lel Shavuot, um, you know, Bernie's not going to thank himself. So, of course, we have, to, <laughs> we have to thank, of course, Bernie Weinstein, as well as Rachel Anderson, who has been uh, recovering from uh, a great deal of challenges to her health. She is, uh, her mind is as vibrant as ever, and her motivation and her oomph is as uh, vibrant as ever. And uh, hopefully she's watching, and we thank her, as well as Mike Steckloff, who helped us with the theme and with uh, also uh, a lot of brainstorming about the speakers this year. I want to sincerely thank the members of this uh, committee. So, Tada Rabah and Yasher Koach. So, Rachel's coming late. Okay, so we'll get the sacred person. Fantastic. Okay, awesome. Um, So, I I just didn't see her there. So, okay. (laughs) So, to bring up Mark Horowitz, he is... Mark Horowitz is a senior vice president and director of Project 412 at the JCC Association of North America, a project which seeks to transform the field of early childhood Jewish education across the continent through recruitment, retention, and professional development of new early childhood Jewish educators. Mark is an ordained cantor from Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion and has graduate degrees in sacred music, philosophy of education, and early childhood education. Horowitz has an honorary doctor of sacred music from that institution and received a special recognition award at the 2002 Van Cliburn Foundation International Piano Competition for Outstanding Amateurs. He was cantor and education director at the former Temple Beth Am and the executive director of the Bureau of Jewish Education, Mark lives with his husband, Tom, in Akron and in Buffalo, and they have 10 children and nine grandchildren. His talk tonight is entitled, Revelation, I Was There Too. And so it is a pleasure to welcome him as our Tikkun's keynote speaker. Cantor Horowitz, Tadar Rabbah. So first of all, I have handouts, so I need help. If you're 
comfortable, if you're comfortable, and only if it's not COVID um, reasons that you're far away, this is a very spread out congregation. If you could get any closer, I will be able to see who you are. Do not have to move, but it's just so nice to see real people in front of me. Thank you. Yai bai bai ya ba bai bai yai bai 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 yai bai bai ya ba bai 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 yai bai bai ya ba bai bai yai bai 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 yai bai bai ya ba bai 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 yai bai bai ya ba bai ya bai bai ya ba bai ya ba bai ya Bye 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 Ya bai bai ya ba bai ya bai bai ya ba bai ya bai bai ya bai 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 ya bai bai ya ba bai ya bai bai ya ba bai ya bai bai ya bai 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 There is a theory one of many, that one of the textual bases for Tikkun El Shavuot is from a passage in the Zohar, a foundational work in the literature of Jewish mysticism, that Rabbi Shimon, who would sit up and study all night as a bride was about to be united with her husband, he would sit up with the bride all night as she studied the original texts and then the Midrash, the stories about the text, and then the mystical interpretations of the texts. The passage that is particularly meaningful to me this evening is that Rabbi Shimon, with all his companions, would sing the songs of the Torah, and they would produce, every one of them, new interpretations of Torah, and would together rejoice. We began with the Nigun. Hopefully, we'll end with it, and you'll sing along this time. It's a wordless melody, simple or complex, slow and meditative, or fast and jubilant, sung over and over and over again. It's a Hasidic tradition, and in Nigunim are meant as mystical prayers and sacred practices, a path to deepen the soul, expand the spirit, and embrace the divine. This nigun we began with this evening was written by Zach Mayer from Boston, a singer, composer, and multi-instrumentalist. Nigunim, the plural, are meant to bring people together as we are doing here tonight. Tonight and through the morning, you will hear both traditional and new interpretations of Torah and our texts. I want to be very sure to characterize myself on the Jewish spectrum. I am a liberal Jew who considers himself very religious, if not strictly observant of traditional rituals. It is important you know where I'm coming from, so if we don't agree with each other in our interpretations and in our thinking about Jewish life and texts, we can find ways to wrestle with each other respectfully. I recently returned from Israel, where I brought our group to Tzipori the geographic location of the original Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the ancient rabbinic court that was formed after the destruction of the Second Temple. While we sat in that very beautiful space, we studied the precepts of the Sanhedrin as a guide for our conversations in order to be respectful and productive. I'm going to suggest them to you tonight so that through the night we can use them for our many conversations as well. 
There are four I'd like to highlight. One is be in an open environment so everyone can see each other. Perfect. Two, ensure all voices are heard without intimidation of anyone. I know everyone who's speaking tonight will ensure that that happens. Make sure you're not surrounded only by those people who agree with you. Now, I don't know about the people sitting next to you, but I'm guessing across the aisles, we have a lot of people here who may not agree with each other. And the last one is a tougher one, and you can work on that as you move through the day. Each member knows how to argue both sides of the argument before making a decision. It's a really important and interesting thing. So Tikkun Lel Shavuot, the fixing of the night of Shavuot, as Rabbi already taught us, was the Jews felt that they had slept late. This is an additional interpretation. Jews felt that they slept late that morning that the Torah was given because they did not feel worthy of being present. It's another interpretation. By staying up the first night of Shavuot, we hope to correct this error and demonstrate our eagerness to learn and be connected to Torah. I want you to keep in mind that notion of feeling worthy of being present at the giving of the Torah because it will become important in my own personal story. In the Safaria Haggadah for Shavuot, Safaria is a wonderful online tool. They call themselves a living library of Torah. It's home to 3,000 years of Jewish texts. You can find it at safaria.org, and I suggest you look. It's a wonderful, important resource. We read the following reinterpretation of the four questions. What is so different on this night from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat all kinds of fruits, just first fruits on this night. On all other nights, we eat all types of food. Now, milk and honey is the treat we like, for whatever reason you choose. On all other nights, we wear what we want. On this night, white is the look. On all other nights, we go early to bed, but tonight, we stay up all night. I'd like us to begin by reading the prayer on your resource sheet, which you can find. It is called A Prayer Before Prayer. It comes from the Eilat Chaim High Holy Day Machzor. Eilat Chaim is a living laboratory for the development and renewal of contemporary Jewish spiritual life. And we read together. I now prepare to unify my whole self, heart, mind, consciousness, body, passions, with this holy community, with the Jewish people everywhere, with all people everywhere, with all life and being, to commune with the source of all being. May I find the words, the music, the movements that will put me in touch with the great light of God, May the beauty of God rest upon us. May God establish the works of our hands, and may the works of our hands establish God. Tonight's theme, in the image of God, the dignity of every Jewish soul, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of blessed memory teaches us, and I quote, after the Tower of Babel, the human condition has meant a world in which, though there is only one God, there are many languages and cultures, each with something unique to contribute to our collective heritage. We tell different stories, we practice different ways of life, yet we are all created in God's image. There are many faiths, but only one world in which we must learn to live together. We pause here for a moment of reflection considering the mass shooting that happened here in our community just three weeks ago. And I repeat once more what Rabbi Sachs said with just a twist. There are many faiths, many races, many ethnicities, but only one world in which we must, in which we must learn to live together. We're going to take a few moments to study in Chavruta, we're going to ask you to do it in a particular way in just a moment. And we're going to explore this idea of Tzelem Elohim, of being made in God's image. 
with the second test in a moment, but don't look at your pages on the resource page. That comes from my own work in early childhood Jewish education and is one of the seven Jewish lenses we use to provide an ethical model for living, a set of resources designed to help us experience increased sanctity in an increasingly confusing commercial and difficult world, and a language through which we can articulate a shared vision that we want to pass on to future generations. The work comes from our JCC Association of North America Early Learning Framework, and I'm happy to talk to you about this any time in the future. This is what I'd like you to do. I want you to choose a partner or two near you. It would be great if they were people you didn't know, but I know you're not going to get up and do that. Read the little portion on that sheet, perhaps out loud. This is not a library. This is a house of study. Jewish study is noisy and replete with the sound of wrestling. What I'd like you to do is find phrases or words that catch your attention and talk about why they catch your attention and do they ring true? Do you disagree with things you're reading and want to explore some questions with each other? Or do you love what you read and want to express why? Today, I want you to only think about questions. We're not looking for answers. Just ask questions of each other and just keep asking questions. This is a very short paragraph and one of many, many interpretations of Selim Elohim. So I'm going to look at my watch and I'm going to give you about five minutes to be able to do this. I expect to hear a lot of noise. If you are sitting not near someone, find someone to sit with or turn around and think, but I want to hear.
You have two minutes. I know it's not enough. Yai bai bai abai bai bai yai bai 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 yai bai bai abai bai 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 yai bai bai abai bai 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 yai bai bai yai bai 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 It's better than turning the lights off, no? I'm wondering if there's anyone here who feels they'd like to just say something about what you read or what you spoke about or the opportunity to sit quietly and, well, not quietly, and talk to people around you. Anybody willing to be brave? It's, we're not going to ask you anything about it. We're just going to ask you to talk. Anyone? Ah, uh, did you all hear that? I'm not, you all heard that. Yeah? So I said no answers, but now you get to answer. <laughs> Anna Marie, you get. Is God evil is what, it, what the question is. It's a remarkably important question that our children, that our neighbors, that people ask. People ask this question at the end of the Holocaust. People ask these questions all the time. And the reality is that it's up for each of us to figure out what that means and what it means to us. Because if we were to go around the room, I think a lot about the image of um, being made in the image of God because of the, I think I might anyway, but because of the work I do working with young children, we have to think a lot of what we believe about children. And if we believe that people were made in the image of God, we believe that children were, obviously. And we have to understand who they are and what they're made of and how that looks and what that's about. So for me, <clears throat> I have no conflict with the fact that there's evil in the word and that I have an image of God. My image of God, which, by the way, call me, write to me, I'll come talk to you about it for hours and we can talk. It's a really important conversation to have. One of the things I always wondered about is people think about God and people don't think about God. People come to synagogue or don't and they believe in God, they don't believe in God and they dismiss it and it's just who they are and what they are and there's not a whole lot of thought about it. I used to say um, a long time ago that when people have problems with their relationships with their spouses or their children or even with friends, they go to therapy for hours and days and years. We spent five minutes on what we believe about God. It takes a lot of work to figure out what you think about that. And it changes as you change. I, I have no two days where I think about God in the same way. And there's never a day that I don't think about what that means because it's so important to me. So that's a beautiful question that I am not going to answer. Anybody else? A thought? 
I want to make you talk. Yes. And that's another, sorry, and that's another important, you can think about this however you please. There are very few things that, you, that I wouldn't accept you to do except to do evil in the name of God. Um, that's a whole other story. Um, here in the city, uh, thank you for doing that with me. Um, we'll get a chance to do a little bit more studying a little later. Here in the city of Buffalo tomorrow, we kick off Pride Week. Although, if you've looked around Elmwood Avenue, the flags have been there for weeks and weeks. Tomorrow morning, there will be a parade, and after that, a festival, which will be a vibrant celebration of Western New York's LGBTQIA community. It's been three years since we have had a parade and a festival in Buffalo because of the pandemic. And yet, tomorrow is, of course, the morning of Shavuot. And so there will be many people, because of their ritual observance, who will not be able to attend those festivities. And I think in light of that, I have been asked to connect this moment of reflection about our personal revelation with the advent of pride. And so I'm going to attempt to share with you some of my own reflections of what revelation has meant in my personal journey, juxtaposed with what the rabbis tell us, that in every generation, each person should consider himself or herself, or I would add themselves, as having personally received the Torah on Mount Sinai. This short part of my talk is a glimpse into my personal wrestling of whether I deserve the honor of being present at Mount Sinai. As you may have read in the title of my conversation with you this evening, the painful reality for me is that the road to my personal revelation was a long and difficult one. I have been in pain over that for decades, and it is only in this last part of my life that I can stand here proudly to say I was indeed there too. How did I get to this place, and how did I get to this evening? My family was not religious, observant, or particularly involved in the practice of Judaism. However, they did enroll me in religious school at a young age in a very large conservative shul on Long Island. It was there where I had friends, soaked up the curriculum, went to school as many days as I possibly could, volunteered, helped my cantor teach others after I became a bar mitzvah, and graduated Hebrew High School as valedictorian of my class. Yes, there was such a thing as valedictorian of our Hebrew High School class. I won't tell you how many people there were because then it will tarnish the image I've just created. <laughs> when I was 12 years old and in Hebrew school, I discovered what I would later come to understand was an attraction to one of my male classmates. It was something I thought about often, and I created in my own mind, and I created scenarios that could only have come from a 12-year-old. But I knew enough to realize that it was a bad thing, and I was certain I would be punished. That classmate of mine died of cancer at a very young age while we were in high school. And those many years later, I was certain it was my fault. Really, I really did. Yom Kippur became the time each year for me to confess that private sin that has haunted me for decades. When studying to become a bar mitzvah, I had a tutor who violated my personal space. We met in a closet, which was used as a study because there was no other room in the synagogue. I said nothing because I was ashamed and I knew that it was somehow my fault. And I also knew that I had secretly enjoyed it. 
When confirmation came at age 16, and my rabbi, whom I adored, reminded us that we were there at Sinai and had the privilege of receiving Torah, I was sure I was nowhere to be found because there was something wrong with me. We had a big pageant in this very large sanctuary, and we marched down the center aisle, laying our sheaves of wheat on the bima. And I lay my sheaf of wheat on the bima in shame, knowing deep inside that I had no right to be there. Later, a few years, I went to the library and acquired a kind way of saying stole, an original cast recording of The Boys in the Band, a groundbreaking 1968 play in which a surprise guest turns an evening upside down when he interrupts a gathering of gay men in New York City. It had a brief and very successful revival on Broadway in 2018. I listened to it endlessly when my parents were not at home to try and figure out what I could learn and where or how or if I fit in. I have no memory of how I even knew it existed. I have had to have listened to it hundreds of times over the years, and I couldn't find myself there either. But I was there somehow, and I didn't dare to believe. Here's the kicker to my early stories. My uncle, my father's brother, has had a male partner since before I was born. They have been together in their professional and personal lives for over 72 years. I was in my late 20s before I even allowed it to occur to me that they might be gay. I was very close to them and spent an enormous amount of time in their home and in their school, and I never allowed it to even cross my mind. And oh, it was a secret of course, and it remains a secret today. My grandmother kept asking my uncle when he was going to find a nice Jewish girl and settle down. I believed that's what he was looking to do. I was clearly there, and I knew what I was not supposed to see, and I knew what I was supposed to do to ignore that revelation. I went to Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, School of Sacred Music, now the Debbie Friedman, I'm proud to say, School of Sacred Music, to study for the Cantorate, and all that, although that institution is very proud of their embracing of LGBT plus Jews today, in those days, they rounded up suspected gay people and warned them that any behavior expressing that lifestyle would not be acceptable, and they would be thrown out. I heard that message that was revealed to me in those days and those stories. And so, with all of the secrets and with all of the shame and all of the denials, I could believe or allow myself to believe that there was no way that I was gay. It was not acceptable. And so, I got married to a woman. I want to be very clear with you, and this is so important to me. I loved my ex-wife, and our relationship was fulfilling in so many ways. We enjoyed each other. We were good parents together. We worked seamlessly as professionals together. And as many of you have, we laughed, we lived, we cried. And yet there was a secret that no, not only had I not revealed to her, but I honestly had not even revealed it to myself. I know how hard it is to understand that, but it's really true. And then, as so many of you know, the worst way that that revelation could happen did, publicly, and of my own accord, on TV, in the newspapers, and all over town. The world came crashing down around my family, so many members of this Jewish community, and most particularly my rabbi and friend, rallied around me and knew that this was the moment when I needed a community more than ever before in my life. 
I know that not everyone was willing to give me that support, indeed quite the opposite. And I also know that not everyone feels that way today. However, so many people supported me that it allowed me to look deeply into myself and see what I had somehow always known and could never reveal to myself, that I was gay and that I could embrace it and be proud. That did not happen easily or immediately. It took a long time and a lot of therapy, a lot of friends, and the love and support of my incredible daughters and my amazing friends. When I was ready to return to the pulpit, Rabbi Mason suggested that my first return be on the high holidays and that I stand before our very large congregation at that time to chant the Hineni prayer. So many of our prayers in Jewish life are us and we. On this occasion, the cantor stands up and in the first person singular chants, Hineni he'onimimas, Nir Ashvanif Khad mi Pachad Yoshev Tehilot Yisrael. Here I am, impoverished in deeds and in merit. But nevertheless, I come before you, God, to plead on behalf of your people Israel. And I chanted. And I wept, and it was a blessing and a gift and one of the most difficult things I have ever done in my life. And it was the beginning of my journey to finally believing that I deserved to be present on Mount Sinai and receive the Torah. As all of my fellow LGBTQIA plus Jews, they were all there as well. And each year on Shavuot, I bow in gratitude for the ability to take my place in that tradition and know in my heart that is where I belong. I stand here this evening with enormous gratitude for this Buffalo Jewish community and will never forget the kindness and support of so many of you in this room and others who are not. My therapist said to me for years that when I became healthy and whole, which I'm still on the road to, and was able to accept who I am and celebrate that, that possibilities of my finding someone who had also done that work would appear, and that we together could continue to grow, face the world, unified, and with the tools we had individually and would collectively acquire and live meaningful and productive lives. 21 years ago, my husband Tom appeared at the window of the original pancake house for our first breakfast. And today we have our five children and their spouses and our nine grandchildren, a remarkable group of friends whom we love and who support us, our challenges and our many celebrations, and we share them together. I was introduced to this commentary called Torah Queries several years ago and have had the gift of studying it with my friend and colleague Mike Steckloff as he guided us through two different conferences in my time in this community. Torah queries, and I quote, builds on the history of feminist commentary by enlarging the circle of former outsiders who now claim the authority to participate in the process of expounding the Torah and by demonstrating the fruitfulness of reading through queer lenses for all those interested in challenging the traditional readings of the Torah. Here I remind you of how I began, declaring my own proclivity for a rather liberal interpretation of Judaism and her ancient texts. In the spirit of Torah queries, Rabbi Joshua Lesser writes about the book of Ruth, which we will read during Shavuot, and suggests the following. He says that Shavuot is one of the least celebrated of our major Jewish holidays for many reasons. And among them, he suggests, is that on Sukkot, we experience the theme we understand, the theme of vulnerability. He says that on Pesach, we explore the themes of liberation and freedom, but that Shavuot is just much more complex. Therefore, Rabbi Lesser suggests, might we turn to the book of Ruth for wisdom? And he posits that because of this Megillah, 
it really should be one of the most popular, as he says, among queer folk. I quote from a passage of his drash. A famine forces Naomi to flee Canaan, her homeland, with her husband and sons. Ultimately, she finds herself in the valleys of Moab, a widow and the witness of the death of both of her sons. Her status is as low as it possibly could be in her society and time. What queer person cannot relate to Naomi's fate at one time or another, feeling lonely, without family, without support, without a clear picture of the future? Surely many of us remember a time like that. If we are lucky like Naomi, that reality changes when she encourages her daughters-in-law to return to a more certain future with security and promise. One daughter-in-law, Ruth, stays and pledges an oath of fidelity, inextricably binding her life to Naomi's forever, giving us one of the Torah's most poignant examples of a family of choice. Rabbi Lesser also suggests that Ruth's pledge is so complete that some people might question if there is more than a mother-daughter bond between them. Could it have been that of a life partner? Indeed, many people, gay and straight folk alike, use Ruth's pledge as part of their lifelong commitment to each other in weddings and commitment ceremonies. The text does not answer what their relationship is, but the question itself is important because it allows us to wonder. Vatome root. Aletifke ivi le osvech. La shuv la shuv me acharaich. Ki el asher tel chi elech. Uva asher talini alin. Asher tamut yamut v'sham v'sham ekaver Ko yase Adonai li v'cho yosif v'cho yosif Ki amavet Yafrid Beini Uvenech Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. Where you will be buried, I will be buried. And only death will be able to separate me from you. Wonder is indeed what we do on this sacred night. And as I begin to come towards a conclusion here, I ask that together we read on the other side of your resource page a poem by Merle Feld. And afterwards, I'm going to give you a few minutes in your chavruta to talk about what it might mean to you, what it's about, and how it might help us thinking about Revelation. It's called We All Stood Together, and it was dedicated to Rachel Adler. And together we read, it's a hard poem to read, so just we'll do our best. My brother and I were at Sinai. He kept a journal of what he saw, of what he heard, of what it all meant to him. I wish I had such a record of what happened to me there. It seems like every time I want to write, I can't. I'm always holding a baby, one of my own, or one for a friend always holding a baby, so my hands are never free to write things down. And then, 
As time passes, the particulars, the hard data, the who, what, when, where, why, slip away from me, and all I'm left with is the feeling, but feelings are just sounds, the vowel barking of a mute. My brother is so sure of what he heard. After all, he's got a record of it. Consonant after consonant after consonant. If we remembered it together, we could recreate holy time, sparks flying. Take a few minutes to just unpack it with yourself, with the people around you. I'm just going to look at four or five minutes. Yai bai 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 I hope you'll continue to do this throughout the night, the day, the weeks, the months. I would like to leave a few minutes at least at the end of our time for any questions or thoughts, although I am happy to talk to you any time. But I want to end 
with a beautiful piece that I hope will give you pause for your own reflections. You have the words to it at the bottom of the resource, and I don't care if you sing along or not this time, because this is what I'd like you to do. I'm going to sing it three times, and I would like you to think about it the following way. The name of this beautiful melody is Kenya Hiratson. May it be God's will, may it be so, may it happen, may we all put a stamp on it. And the first time I'm going to sing it, the words are the same except for pronouns. I would like you to think about yourself and think how the words can be helpful to you. How do you be safe? How do you be free? And where do you find space? And then the second time, I'd like you to sing it for someone else, someone who's always there to support you, someone who's around, someone who you want to give that feeling to, or someone who's really difficult in your life that you'd like to bring that to, or both, if you can handle that in your head. And the third time we sing it, we sing it for a community, all of the communities that you belong to, your families, your synagogue, your Jewish community, your communities around town, whatever they are. This was written by Ilana Arian, a very talented young musician and composer. <clears throat> May I be safe, may I be free, may I find space, space to just be. Can you hear our song? Can you hear our song? May I find my way back home? Can you hear our song? Can you hear our song? May I find my way back home? May you be safe. May you be free. May you find a space, space to just be. Can you hear our song? Can you hear our song? May you find your way back home. Can you hear our song? Can you hear our song? May you find your way back home. May we be safe. May we be free. May we find a space, space to just be together. Can you hear our song? Can you hear our song? May we find our way back home. Can you hear our song? Can you hear our song? May we find our way back home. I want to just say thank you. This was not easy for me. Familiar faces helped. Spending a long time thinking about it. Mike daring me to do this, although he didn't know that's what he was doing when he asked me to do this. It was a gift. Tom for listening to me complain for weeks about whether I take the risk or whether I just come up and teach something. So I taught about me and I taught about my Jewish life and who I am and it feels good and I'm very grateful and it feels scary and I'm very grateful. So I am going to one last time do this nigun with you so we can have a denouement, a little bit of a Let's fall out of this. And then we, I think we have about four or five minutes left if you would like to say anything or think anything or be able to. I'm happy for you to do that. And I'm always happy to have you do that 
in between our breaks and also anytime if you want to get in touch. Yai bai bai yai bai 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 yai bai 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 yai bai bai yai bai 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 yai bai bai yai bai 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 yai bai 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 yai bai bai yai bai 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 yai 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 bai bai Bye bye bye. Yai bye bye. Ya bye bye. Yai bye bye. Ya bye bye. Yai bye bye. Ya bye bye. Yai bye. Yai bye. Yai bye. Yai bye. Yai bye 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 bye. Yai bye bye. Ya bye bye. Yai bye bye. Ya bye bye. Yai bye bye. Yai bye 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 bye. Yai bye 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 bye. Yai bye 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 bye. Yai bye 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 bye. Thank you. Silly to ask you to talk now, but I'm around if you'd like to. Uh, there must be an announcement for what happens next. Mark, a uh, heartfelt and sincere Yashikoach for sharing Torah, sharing perspectives, and uh, most importantly, sharing of yourself. I should, uh, uh, one idea that definitely resonated, even though this may not have been the main thing you were trying to convey, um, uh, you mentioned about being valedictorian of the, your religious school class. Uh, I, I graduated high school from a, a tiny Jewish day school. I was uh, part of a class of uh, seven. And um, I have, always relished the opportunity to note that I was in the top 10 of my uh, graduating class, and um, that's certainly been one of my proudest accomplishments. Uh, in, all, uh, in all seriousness, it, uh, you know, it, it takes uh, a great deal of koyach, a great deal of uh, strength to be able to uh, take time and uh, share of yourself and to give of your heart. And uh, I, I was not, I admit not to have not been familiar with some of uh, the, uh, some of the struggles that you referred to. And I am uh, grateful for the knowledge and uh, grateful for you uh, to be a part of uh, our community. So tada raba. Um, in a moment where we're going to uh, recite the Mariv service, the service for the uh,